Hey everyone, in this tutorial series, I'll be showing you how to make your own PS1 mascot character. Back in the day, it seemed like everyone was trying to latch onto the same kind of popularity that Sonic had. Bubsy, Jazz Jackrabbit, Spyro, Gex, all of them got that 90s attitude. What could possibly go wrong? Now, I will say that this isn't an entry-level Blender tutorial. I'm going to be covering everything. Modeling, UV mapping, texturing, shape keys, facial and body rigging, and finally animation. I'm going to be focused and more interested on explaining the technique on why you do something instead of explaining every keystroke you need to get from A to B. I'll explain some important functions as they come up, but I expect that you don't need me to tell you to press E to extrude things. With that said, let's get started with the series. So like every mascot character from the 90s, it's got to be an anthropomorphic animal of some kind. Some basic color scheming, expressed body type, and some quirky assets or theme to sell the design. So to demonstrate this as an example, um... Green Pirate Crocodile, that'd be King K. Rule from Donkey Kong. Uh, fighter Pilot Fox, Fox McCloud. And uh, one last one, uh, Red Squirrel in a Hoodie. Well, that's Conker. So we just gotta settle on some basic ideas and we can get started. I got a whole list of animals that I keep saved, and I have a raffle game that I use to generate ideas. For the sake of this video, I'll just run that and see what I'll be doing. Uh, Zebu? What the hell is a Zebu? It's like, oh, it's like a, it's like a breed of cow. All right. Okay, so going into the character modeling process, it's a good idea to have a plan for what the final model should look like. So if you got the time and patience for it, you should collect references for your model, either anatomical references or artistic inspiration. Do this to build a general feel for what you want out of your character. And if you're really patient, what you can do is draw out a reference sheet to show how your character should look in different positions and orientations. I, however, am not a planner or a drawler. I tend to do things on the fly, so you might see things that are not in the final product and I'll point them out as I go. So to begin the modeling process, I'm going to start with the head, which is one of the key focuses of a character. It's where the eyes are naturally drawn to. And to make the head, I'm going to utilize the power of a subdivided cube. So in my empty default scene, I'm going to place a cube at the world origin and go into edit mode. And I'm going to subdivide the cube with the smoothness set to 1. Now another reason why I'm not explaining every keystroke that I make is because I'm using a key layout that is specific for my workflow. I still use the layout from the 2.7x era of Blender, so my hotkeys might not be the same for you, but I'll try my best. And with the cube subdivided, I'm going to set it to shade smooth and delete the right side of the cube so I can add a mirror modifier. For the mirror modifier, it's important that you enable clipping, and this is to prevent the vertices of your model from passing through the mirroring point and makes them stick together like this. And here we have the basis for our low poly head. If you want a more human head, you can take this vert here in the front and hit Alt V to rip the topology to create a ridge for the nose. For more animalistic heads, we can take the bottom front face and extrude it out to make a snout and maybe add a loop cut for extra detail. And for a build, what you can do is you can take these three edges, subdivide it, and extrude out the resulting faces and scale them down to get a bird's beak. And for either bird or animal snout, if you want even more detail, you can select the mouth, subdivide these edges here, and rip the topology to form the opening for the mouth. I'll be making a facial rig for this character, so I'll be doing this. So with a few small references I quickly found online and with proportional editing turned on, I took the head base and tweaked it to fit the shape that I needed by simply dragging things around until I was satisfied. Basically, I'm comparing my model to the front and side references and then adjusting it based on my understanding on the structure of the skull. On the subject of modeling, a while back, I received a few questions in the comments that I wanted to address because I think they're important to understand as you model. One person asked me why I worked with quads and not tries when it came to modeling PS1 style models as tries were used for the most optimal geometry. And another person asked me if they had to adhere to only using quads for good topology. So hopefully this will address both of those questions. For modeling, quads are just easier to work with and Blender is designed with this workflow in mind. There's a reason for this and it's based around how the quads tile. And there are selection tools based around this idea that allow you to select rings or rows of faces for the ease of editing purposes. While tries tile in a way that is not conducive to this kind of selection. And by working exclusively in tries, this makes the process harder than it needs to be. And secondly, if you're 3D modeling, you're kind of already working with tries whether you want to or not. All faces are made up of tries whether or not you can see them or not, and that's because they're calculated for you. Most times you won't notice the difference, however sometimes, like here, the profile of the faces will go against the shape that you want them to be. And to quickly fix this, I simply select the two adjacent verts that I want to connect and hit J to join them. 
and this will correct the face's shape. So I hope that answers both of those questions. Once I got my head into the shape I wanted it to be, it was time to add the eyes, ears, and whatever else I needed for the head. Starting with the ears, I added a cube and then deleted the face so it would be inside of our character's head. No reason to draw polygons where you can't even see them. From here, I extruded out the ear to a tip and then collapsed these edges back here to make it more low poly. And then I extruded this edge ring into the head. And then I did some more shape tweaking and triangulating. For the horns, I added an equilateral triangle by adding a circle with no fill and set the vert count to 3. Then I placed where it should start and to extrude it out quickly, I held control and clicked to the points that I wanted them to be. Then I brought the horns to a point and then rotated them to match the reference. And to finish up the head for the eyes, I did something that I would later change. The eyes would be planes that sat on top of the face like this. However, as you can see, instead of just using a plain mesh, I decided to use a circle. I don't know what I was thinking, I think I was going to try to have the eyes use hard edges with no transparency, but I eventually changed my mind on this. I was also going to give the character a monocle, but I would also later decide against this. The only original features that I kept the same were the eyebrows, which were just simple planes as they should have been. Moving on to the neck, I again added a circle, but this time not by mistake. I set the vert count to 4 and deleted the vert on the right side and used this to create a small segmented neck mesh. I used this instead of a cube because, remember, we're using a mirror modifier and a cube would give us this shape, which I'm going to be using for the torso, but it's also higher poly than what I would want the neck to be. By making the neck this way, it'll lower our poly count, and with it shaded smooth, it'll give the illusion that it's actually rounder than what it actually is. Now for the torso, like I said, I'm using the cube to make the shape, and after adding the cube to the model, I'm going to delete the face where it's going to be connecting to the right side. If we don't delete it now, it'll cause problems as we extrude the torso down and bringing the unneeded face down with it. Not only is it an internal face, which won't be seen, it'll also cause shading and normal problems, which will be visible in the final product. For the shape, I wanted to make it rather exaggerated. I wanted it to be bulky, top heavy, a complete unit, if you will. Or for those of you who are more interested in terminology, he's going to have a mesomorphic body type. So I need to exaggerate the musculature, but I also got to follow the curvature of the spine so as to not have a flat body shape. For the pelvis, I duplicated the lower half of the torso and moved it down. Later on, I would delete the underside of the torso because it wouldn't be seen from the outside anyway. For the legs, I was initially kind of messing around, and I just wanted to see what would look correct for this body type that I was making. I kind of just took a cube and started extruding it. I extruded down, and when I came to a joint, I just extruded enough to make a new face and then extruded to make the next shape. I initially had it the wrong way around, however when I flipped it, despite what I had thought, the topology was already perfectly structured for this deformation. I just had to shape it up, round it out at the joints as best I could, and add hoods. I also triangulated at the points where the legs would bend. Then I just sort of shaped the body around it to make it fit better. I don't know why I always do this to myself, but I always seem to end up with these degenerate legs. I just can't bring myself to use something different for characters like this. Speaking of different legs, it pays to know your anatomy so you can translate it to your models. After all, not every character is going to be the same, and you should know how they work, so that way you can structure them properly. For instance, here is a sample of a few different legs across the animal kingdom that you can use, with topology and rigging for demonstration purposes. From left to right, we have the humanoid leg, the standard quadruped leg, and the quote-unquote backwards legs that birds have. In actuality, these three leg types are just varying expressions of these four bone groups of the leg, the upper leg, the lower leg, the foot, and the toes. Us humans stand on the bottom two bone groups, and as we walk, we roll up onto our toes. As for animals, however, they stand on the ball of their foot, with varying lengths of the thigh, shin, and foot bones. For a lot of quadrupeds, the first three bones tend to be relatively similar in length, with the thigh staying parallel to the foot bones, whereas for birds, their thighs tend to be either short or located inside their body like penguins. Of course, I'm only speaking generally, I'll leave the actual research up to you, but if you're interested, the small demo scene is available for download in the description below. When it came time to do the arms, I really wanted to sell them as being big and bulky, so I decided to extrude them out from a pentagon that I got from adding a circle mesh with the verts set to 5. However, when I got them into place, I kind of felt weird having the legs being connected as they were in the arms not. So I caved in and joined the upper and lower arm segments together, and because of that, I had to give it a little bit of extra topology so that way they deform properly. If you're unfamiliar with the ideas of rigging a mesh, or how to consider how a model would deform when you apply a rig, here's how I tend to think about it. With any kind of limb or joint, if we're talking about an organic one, like an elbow, as these represent, when a joint bends, one side will expand, while the other side will contract. 
there's no topology for this to happen, it'll just kind of collapse at the joint and it definitely won't look good. So to fix that, we just need to take this edge here that'll be the joint and bevel it by two segments till we get three edges like this. Now the mesh will have enough topology to bend on this side, but the problem is now gonna happen at the inside of the joint where the mesh begins to clip in on itself. As you can see, this is a problem because it's causing the faces to shimmer from overlapping. Fortunately, this has a few solutions. Number one, you can just simply pinch in these two edges here on the inside of the elbow and that'll fix the shimmering problem. But you might get this weird divot on the inside when deforming, which could be solvable from either weight painting or shape keys. But I'd like to avoid weight painting when I can and I'm not gonna cover shape keys until a future video. Option two, you can collapse the inner edges to a single edge like this. This is what I used for the legs and they worked fantastically. However, they worked good because they were modeled with the 90 degree bend in them. And as it stands right now, when bending the arm inward, there is some extreme distortion happening here. So for the arms, I generally avoid this structure, which leads me to the option I prefer to go to, option three. Instead of collapsing them down to one singular edge, I take the inner edge and slide it away and triangulate the adjacent faces of the elbow to get a structure like this. And to fix the shimmering issue, I scale this inner edge of the arm in. And now when the arm deforms, it looks much better than the previous versions. And with that knowledge, I applied this to my character's arm. For the hands, I was gonna have a slight challenge to get a clean shape at this angle. But to get started, I added a cube and scaled it down. And then I set my transform orientation to normals as I would be using this to make sure that the hands didn't get all wonky. It didn't help in the immediate sense. It wasn't behaving like I would expect it to. And I had to rely on scaling them on the normals by hitting Alt-S. But when I transformed individual faces at the time, it behaved much better. Once I got the cube into a position that looked good, I shaded it smooth and got to work on extruding out the rest. On the inside where the thumb would be, I took these two wedges and subdivided them to get this face here, which I then took and extruded out. I took this edge here and slid it back into the wrist and then extruded this face out here to form the thumb. As for the rest of the hand, I took the face where the knuckles would begin and extruded them out. And using the normal transforms, I moved it to keep the fingers aligned with the hand. And of course, since the index fingers are longer than the pinky, I pulled this part of the hand down to represent that. Now that the majority of the model was done, I decided it was time to clean up a bit. The character is absolutely giant and buried into the world floor plane. If I exported him as he is right now, he would look a bit like this. So uh, we gotta shrink him down a bit and put his feet on the ground. So I'm just gonna go into object mode and select him to pull him up till his feet are sitting on top of the floor plane and then scale him down till he's about two meters tall. And once this is done, I hit control A to apply the location and the scale. Of course, these aren't the only things that you should be cleaning up. You should make sure that your model doesn't have any doubled vertices, that the normals of your model are facing outward and that there are no strange internal faces in your model. Now, all of these things can negatively impact the rest of your work, making UV mapping, texturing, and rigging much more difficult. So to check for these in respective order, for doubled vertices, select your entire mesh and hit M to bring up the merge menu and hit merge by distance to get rid of any doubled vertices. For normals, you can go into the overlay dropdown here and turn on face orientation. And this will display all faces as either blue or red. Blue meaning outside, red meaning inside. And we want the entire mesh to be blue. The eyes and other mesh planes like the eyebrows will look red from certain angles, but as long as they look blue from the front, it's fine. If you're red blue colorblind, what you can do instead is turn on the face normals here, which instead will project small lines from the faces. And the goal is you want all of them to be facing away from your model. To do this, what you can do is you can select the entire model and hit Alt N to bring up the normals menu and hit recalculate outside. And for any faces that are not recalculated properly, you can just select them and hit flip face to correct them to the way that you want them. And for internal faces, you want to be in face select mode. Then go up here to select and then down here to select by trait. And then you can collect internal faces. This should select any weird faces that could have formed during the modeling process so you can delete them. Finally, after cleaning up, there's one last thing that I have to add before the modeling portion of this video is over, and that's the tail. Now the tail, I wanted to have a little bit of asymmetry. So the tail mesh can't go into the character object because of the mirror modifier. It has to be its own separate object, like the monocles, which I haven't deleted yet. So to make the tail, I added a circle with the vert set to four and deleted the soon to be internal face. I then selected and extruded it down. And when I got to where the tip would be, I flared the tail out and triangulated it at the bottom so I could poke these faces out at the bottom to get this sort of paintbrush look. And with that, we have basically finished the modeling portion of the character. And from here, we can move on to UV mapping and texturing, which is the next big bulk of the character making process. Anyway, I hope that was helpful. Be sure to like and subscribe or leave a comment telling me that you like this video. It's one of the only ways that I know that it's worth continuing. If you want to support what I do, you can support me on Ko-Fi or check out any of my other important links down below. But other than that, yeah, that's all I have to say. So see ya.